What is up, ladies and gentle nerds? It's your boy Graham, also known as HamHawks42 on the internet. Today we are going to be looking at yet another random magic card. This particular show is available on YouTube as well as anywhere you get your podcasts. So wherever you are, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, if you want to see a video feed, YouTube. If you want this in your car, podcast. Awesome. Because get off your phone when you're driving. Just saying. You know this. I know this. We all know this. But let's uh, let's just say it out loud. Because uh, I don't know about you, but... I don't know. The temptation is real. Okay, so what are what card are we looking at today? This is randomly selected, but we got a juicy one today, guys. We are looking at Mox Emerald. This card is if you if you haven't heard of the Moxin, um, and that's the other thing, Moxin. Yes, I did not say Moxes. If you haven't heard of the Moxin, then uh, you must be new to the game, which is totally fine. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for thank you for checking out. Um, the Moxin are artifacts that were in the original set and what they do is they cost zero to put into play nothing and when i say they're artifacts i'm talking about old school artifacts so they don't have any colors so there's their colorless permanence cost zero to put into play and you can tap it to add one green mana to your mana pool um yeah and it's funny actually the, the way that it was originally printed uh, it says, add one green mana to your mana pool, period. That's just what's written on the card. Tapping this artifact can be played as an interrupt. Because the rules have changed a lot over the years, guys. Yeah, Mox Emerald was originally printed in Alpha. This was part of the original, you know, this is right out of the gate, you know, first set ever. Because basically they didn't really know how good mana was. And they didn't realize how important mana was. And also in those early days, the spells that you were casting were significantly less powerful in a lot of cases, which is funny because when you think about it now, we think of old cards as being incredibly powerful, much like the Moxin. Now, this particular one is the Emerald. It is a... Um, yeah, the Mox Emerald is the green version. There's one for every single color. And there are a number of other Mox that uh under other Moxin that exist over the have over the years. Like Chrome Mox is the first one that come to comes to mind. And um they uh or Mox there's a Mox Amber, I think. Or, yeah, anyway. But they're all artifacts that cost zero um and produce some kind of effect. Now the old school Mox and the original five are part of the power nine. And that is the cycle of nine cards that are far and away the single strongest or the, well, the nine strongest cards ever to be printed in magic. There are also cards like Ancestral Recall, which costs one blue, you draw three cards. Uh, you know, it's pretty good. That's a, that's a pretty good rate. Um, we also have Black Lotus, which can produce three mana of any one color um, once for free, basically. Just completely free. You just get three mana. Uh, uh, and the flexibility is astonishing. So these things are fantastic. Yeah, obviously, they're incredibly powerful. But as a result, it's not legal to play them in almost any format because any format that wants to be fun whilst staying competitive and even staying powerful can't really support cards of this power level it's funny because it's not much to look at like when you first are playing the game you think oh it's just like another land like this plays once it's in play it's just like another forest that's it i mean i guess it's an artifact so you could synergize with that in some cases but it doesn't look like much to a new player you look at this and go okay and then you, you know you look at the price tag and realize it's going for like I don't know, two, three thousand dollars or whatever it is. Like freaking what? Well, and the thing about the Moxin that are so ridiculous, and the reason that they're so incredibly powerful, is if you are running these, if you were allowed to run four of each different mox in your deck, you could have you I mean, you could very easily have 20 moxin and no lands. You wouldn't need lands. And I'm sure you're thinking, well, what, what's the benefit of that? Well, you can only play one land in any given turn. There is no restriction as to, to the number of Moxin that you can play. So if you, had, if you had nothing but... If you didn't have lands and you only had Moxin, you could just play all of them on your very first turn. And however many you... So if you start with a hand of three, you just have three mana available on board right away out of the gate before your opponent has had a chance to do anything. That's insane. You know, you can't come back from that. Like, that would be just crippling. And so that's that's why this card is banned in 
almost every format, including uh, Legacy and Commander. You just can't, you're not allowed to have them, period. Just, nope, get them out of here. The only format, the only competitive format where you are still allowed to play any of the Moxon is Vintage. Vintage, you are allowed to play them, but you are only allowed to have one in your deck. And so, actually, that, and that's true of all the Power 9. Vintage is a format where cards are almost never banned. In fact, up until about a month ago, two months ago now, I would have said cards are never banned in Vintage because cards are almost never banned in Vintage. No matter how strong, no matter how oppressive, no matter how impossible they are to deal with, Vintage is like the last format of official competitive magic that allows everything but within reason and so those cards that are incredibly powerful like the moxon like black lotus etc you're only allowed to have one in your deck and so that's the way that they get around it so like yes if you happen to draw it okay and so when you're looking at the power nine free mana abilities you've got the five mox you've got the black lotus Okay, so that's six cards out of your deck. So if you start with two of those in your opening hand, plus you know, plus a land, you're going to be in just fine shape. And it really doesn't matter which two. You're going to be in phenomenal shape. Um, and your opponent will have to leverage something, you know, things like Force of Will that are free counter spells in order to combat what you're doing. Um, so, like, that's one of those situations where it does come down to luck to some degree, but the other side of it is that's that format. That is what you get when you play in Vintage. Those opportunities are available to you in Vintage in a way that they aren't in other formats. There's nothing wrong with that. There's a you know there's got to be a place for every card. Um, that's something that Wizards clearly focuses on and clearly tries to establish is we want a healthy game. We want a game where people can get the play experience that they want, but also we want all of these cards to retain value. We want all of these cards to provide enjoyment and fun to someone. And whether that's just from the collector angle, which there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, compare Magic cards for a second to sports cards. You know, if you have a Babe Ruth rookie card, that thing is worth thousands, if not millions of dollars at this point. Well, what does it do? It does nothing. It's a little strip of cardboard that has a picture of a really good baseball player on it or a historically significant baseball player on it. That's all it is. But that little strip of cardboard was printed decades ago, if not centuries ago at this point. I'm not I'm not a history person. I apologize. Any any sports history buffs out there, I'm sorry if I'm if I'm getting that wrong. But but that card is a relic of the past and it's trackable. You can see how old it was and you can see where it's come from. You can see the this little scrap of history that turned out to be something really special for baseball. And so if you happen to have a little strip of cardboard from that time period that is inarguably a piece of that history, that's something special. And all it is is a little strip of cardboard. That's it. You can just look at it and go, man, that's cool. I have that. Well, that's why Mox Emerald here is worth a couple thousand dollars. Are you going to be playing it? No, you're not allowed to. Because if you have access to this and your opponent doesn't, you have an unfair advantage and they are not going to enjoy the game. Like, and to an extreme degree. And so... Ultimately, yeah, you can't play with this unless you're playing against other people who have it and you're, you know, lining up at a vintage table. So it's a special piece of history. You know, the idea of spending the idea of spending two grand on a Mox Emerald. And it's funny too, because when you look at it, it has the old brown frame, which they moved away from because it's not aesthetically pleasing um the text on it is almost illegible in certain points the the text in the text box itself is really crowded it's tough to to read and it's funny the artwork um the, the artwork on this was commissioned by a gentleman named dan frazier who if uh I, I recently read an article actually about it was an interview with him about the artwork on the mox and and uh, he did all of them he did all five mox and and uh he actually gave uh, some interviewers a hard time because somebody actually commented and let him know that uh, I, you know, something to the effect of, I think your 
I think the mocks are, I, I think your mocks artwork is beautiful. And the person said, no, you don't. You know, Dan Frazier was like, no, 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 you don't. They're not that great. They're fine. But at the time, Wizards paid him like 50 bucks or whatever to slap together five pictures. And the direction he got was, it's a mox. What's a mox? I don't know. It's a thing. And so he just decided like, all right, they're going to be pendants. And so he's, he, you know, painted some pendants or, you know, drew up some pendants. And there's nothing wrong with this artwork. It's they're they're lovely little pictures, um, but he even like he, Dan Frazier, the artist, has been on the book saying, "Guys, this, the artwork on these is not great. This is not my best work." However, they it they are attached to a very powerful piece of history of this card game, and that's why you guys like them so much. You know, I personally don't think there's anything wrong with that, and I think he did a fine job. Understanding he's a working artist and. A card game, con- you know, contract contracted him to put together some artwork for for their cards. Cool, like he did, and he did a fine job. He delivered. They look they look good. Are they gorgeous pieces of art? You know, I- independent of the of Mox Emerald, would I want that picture hanging in my hallway? Eh, like not really, if I'm honest. And I don't think Dan Frazier's offended by that, <laughs> you know. Um, but do I want a do I want A framed Mox Emerald hanging in my hallway? Oh, you better believe I do. 100% all day, every day. Because that is a strip of cardboard that is a beautiful collector's relic from the start of what has become the trading card game that has started an entire genre. And it happens to be my favorite game of all time. And it's a part of it's a part of the history that I want to surround myself with. So the idea that pe- people are spending thousands of dollars to get mint copies of Mox Emerald or near mint copies of Mox Emerald or even slightly damaged copies of Mox Emerald, I get it. I absolutely get it. Do I want one? You better believe I do. Uh, can I justify that kind of expense? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> As so very few people can. But at the same time, it makes sense, you know? There's That is the coolest thing about Magic, is you have a fun, engaging game, first and foremost, but you also have a beautiful, rich collector's environment as well. And Mox Emerald is a lovely piece of that. As, as a game piece, it doesn't work very well at all. It's funny, actually, if you look... Right now, if you're looking at Mox Emerald, it is broken. And we use the phrase broken to mean too powerful to be playable. If you look back at Oko, people are looking at Oko, which, by the way, does have a phenomenal piece of art on it, and it was an incredibly valuable card. Oko is almost universally hated as a failure. It is an incredibly powerful card that has a ton of waves within the game. It had huge ripples on the game with the moment it dropped because it had this type of power. It had the level of power that a card just shouldn't have. And now the difference between Oko, Thief of Crowns, and the Mox Emerald... Mox Emerald has two decades of history and this beautiful nostalgia tied to it. Oko doesn't have any of that. Oko showed up. He wasn't even an older character. Like, that's the thing. Like, when you look at Urza in modern, a lot of people complain that Urza, um, Lord High Artificer, is an incredibly powerful broken card. But at the same time, Urza is a character that fans of the game have been following for decades. And Urza is a person. Urza the Planeswalker is a character that we know and love if we've been following the game. And so there's this kind of like push and pull. Now you put any other name on that character. And I think a lot more people are going to hate it. And with Oko, he was a brand new character. He was a brand new planeswalker. His power level was pushed to the point where the game stopped being fun. And it just reached. Oko thief of crowns is what happens when a card like Mox Emerald doesn't get grandfathered into the game. And Mox Emerald is a card that is highly valuable, highly loved and appreciated because it's broken. But it's more than that. It's the history. And there's something incredibly beautiful about that. And all the Power Nine 
are like that. And actually, another example that I, another one I want to throw out there is Soul Ring. Soul Ring was actually a card that was originally printed back at the same time. And if you look at really old school Soul Ring, Soul Rings, it looks like a, a circular sun. Now, Soul Ring is a card that's been reprinted in a ton of different Commander products. Heck, I have one. Um, you know, I <laughs> I have one just just off camera. It's you know we they're they're everywhere um, because in they've decided like Wizards has decided that it's a card that should be legal in Commander um, because Commander is a very casual format. Now, Soul Ring itself fits in almost any de any deck. It gives you two mana for one mana, and it, it's all generic. It's all colorless. That it's just a, it's an unquestionably good card. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's banned in just about every uh, tournament format, like any competitive format, because it's unfair. It is universally unfair. But Wizards keeps reprinting it for Commander because it's just it's a casual format, and the idea is it's it's a format where things can be busted and can still be fun. And so Soul Ring is an example of that. And, and you see Soul Ring going for 2 or $3 right now in its cheapest printings, if any of the reprint versions. However, if you look at some of the rarer printings of it, they are still going for an incredibly high number. If you have like a beta Soul Ring, that thing is worth hundreds of dollars. Because not only is it a playable card that is very powerful and people like in this one format... But the moment you have the collector value on top of it, it goes through the roof. Another one that's a phenomenal example of that is Birds of Paradise. Birds of Paradise has re been reprinted dozens of times. You can get a Birds of Paradise right now for, I don't know, two, three bucks. Like, it's not hard to get your hands on a functional Birds of Paradise if you want it to play the game. But if you want an alpha Birds of Paradise, you better be ready to pony up about three grand. Because the collector value on that is just so high. Because it is such a rare beautiful piece of the past it's just so cool and there's so many cards from alpha that are like that so many cards now and the reason that i'm talking about these ones specifically is because they're they're playable they're still good they're still powerful by today's standards but there are a lot of really older cards that frankly are terrible nowadays or just not good like shiv and dragon is one of the first ones that come to comes to mind it is not good by today's standards it got reprinted in m20 it has been standard legal this whole time. It is in Arena right now. You know how many people are playing it? Nobody. I love playing weird janky brews, including weird bank janky brews that depend on big chonky red creatures. And I don't have Shiv and Dragon in that list. Because it just isn't quite good enough by today's standards. In Limited, it's just fine. But in Constructed, eh, not so much. Well, in Alpha, Shiv and Dragon was a bomb that thing was a game ending powerhouse and so as a result you can get a copy of shiv and dragon right now for probably 10 cents if you don't care what printing it is but if you want an alpha shiv and dragon be ready to pony up a couple hundred bucks because it has the collector value it has that nostalgia value um it's fascinating those two the the, the places where magic value comes from is something that i find absolutely fascinating and yeah, and this is some, this is where uh, where we ended up. Special thanks to Mox Emerald, which is a, a lovely little card from the past that really gets my juices flowing. And uh, it's also on the reserve list. We will never see these reprinted ever, and we never should, frankly, because um, they're just like they're 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 just way too powerful. They do not fit in the game as we know it today. And I don't want to I don't want to play a game where the Mox and do fit. Because that power level would be far too high. Um, and even if it was accessible financially, I don't believe it's the play experience that I would like. But I understand some people out there do enjoy it and do love it. And for those folks, the vintage format exists. And for that, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that that exists. I am grateful that Wizards understands that this game is a lot of things to a lot of people. And they're willing to make sure that there's a home for every card and there's a home for every player. I think that that deserves a uh, tip of the hat you know so anyway thank you so much for hanging out guys it's been an absolute delight you can find me over on twitch twitch.tv slash hamhocks 42 i will catch you next time